Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday morning, 1130 Mountain Time. We'll be here together for about an hour. And um, this is Ask the Gap Chef, Monica Corrado. That would be me. Um, you can ask the Gap Chef any questions about gaps, any questions about cooking for the gaps diet, etc., etc. Again, hello, Diana. So, just so everyone knows, I think you're all aware that uh, my free gift to you is my cooking for well-being gut and psychology syndrome. That is GAPS intro diet chart, free to you on this group. Go ahead, make a copy, download it, print it out, put it on your refrigerator, take notes on it, etc., etc., etc. This is for you, and uh, please invite any friend of yours who you think would benefit to uh, or benefit by all of these things. Talking about gaps, having gaps questions answered live, uh, getting their own chart, invite them to the page. Okay, so hello, Ellie. Good to have you. Hello, Diana. Good to have you. Hello to everyone else who's not saying hi yet, but who is watching. Um, welcome, welcome. Good to have you all with us today, with me. So, where do we want to start? Where do we want to start? I'd like to start by talking about die-off because I just had an interesting conversation with uh, someone who's just starting GAPS and their concern was avoiding uh, what we call a Herxheimer reaction. Hello, Delphine. Hello, Jane. Hello, hello. Um, avoiding a massive die-off, if you will, that would set you back. And what I really want to encourage all of you uh, to do, to know, to understand is that you are in the driver's seat. You. You get to decide how quickly you go, how slowly you go, how much you, uh, probiotic food you increase or how much you increase by, how much you add into your diet, etc., etc. It's up to you. You are in the driver's seat. You do not have to have massive die-off reactions that land you, you know, with flu-like symptoms uh, in your, you know, in the bed for two days out cold because you feel so lousy. It's really, really up to you, folks. So my, um, I encourage you again, find the place that feels good to you. Find the amount that feels good to you for you to increase when you're having yogurt or increase when you're having kefir or increase when you're having sauerkraut juice, find that level that feels good to you. As I was mentioning, it really is important that um, you feel a little bit of something like, hmm, yeah, having that extra teaspoon of sauerkraut juice, I can feel it's repopulating my gut. I can feel there's a little bit of bloating maybe there's a little bit of discomfort, maybe a little bit, that means you're moving in the right direction. Um, so find that level that's best for you, for your child, for your husband, for your spouse, for whoever it is that you're working with, and increase by that amount. So this doesn't have to be a big, big drama for everyone. This doesn't have to be a big, big fear for everyone of I'm going to have a massive die-off reaction and then I'm gonna be sick, and then I'm gonna drop off the GAPS diet. So you are in control. Dr. Natasha says it all the time when she teaches. GAPS is two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. And it's two steps forward, one step back. It's like a dance. And for everyone, that dance is going to look a little different. And for everyone, we can decide how much we're going to increase the amount of probiotic food we're taking and how easily, uh, meaning how often, et cetera, et cetera. Really, folks, so you're in control. You're in the driver's seat. This is not a race. This is healing. It's deep healing. And the older that you are and or the more severe your symptoms, 
the longer it's going to take. And so we really want to make sure that you're going very, very slowly at the pace that's good for you. Okay, I hope, I hope that was good for everybody. At the, you know, this is not a race. This is deep healing and it takes time. And really GAPS is a journey, which is what Dr. Natasha talks about all the time. It's a journey of learning about your body and how it responds to things. It's a journey about, uh, of learning how to cook and make foods you've never done before. It's a journey about connecting with the uh, farmers for the first time, maybe local farmers near you. It's a, it's a journey, so don't rush through it. Savor it, enjoy it, and uh, I know you're all doing your best. Okay, so we've got some questions in here. Leonie is here, hello. Angela is here, hello. Dana is here, hello, Dana. Hello, 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 Ellie. Ellie asks, does die off happen to everyone? It should. Oh, did I say that? Yes. Die-off should happen to everyone because what causes die-off? Good question, Ellie. Thank you for that. Um, what causes die-off? Uh, a couple things. When I'm teaching, I teach it this way. One, the, the starvation of pathogenic uh, microbes, bacteria, etc. When you starve them of sugar, they're going to die off. So we hope that happens. When we bring in, we introduce probiotic foods. We're going to have a battle in there and you're going to have die off. So yes, we hope that happens. Another thing is um, when we eat meat stock and when we have egg yolks, we're going to have some die off. So yes, die off happens to everyone. The question is whether or not the die off is going to be severe. Like, and that's what I'm trying to say in the beginning of this conversation we're having today, in the beginning of this little live conversation, you get to calibrate, you get to toggle, you get to control how fast the die-off happens by the amount of these foods that you're putting into your body. If you're having too much die-off, back off the amount. Meaning, if you're uncomfortable, you're having a big flare, back off the amount, decrease the amount. Maybe take a day and just rest and then start again at a smaller amount. So very, very important. Ellie has seen no die off in my son. He's on stage two. Okay, then you can do a couple things, Ellie. One would be increases meat stock for sure, right? So remember that we've come up with this uh, number of cups of meat stock per day. So infants, one cup a day. Children, two to three cups a day. Adults, mm, four or five cups a day if you can do it. So either increase your die off or, um, so, pardon me, increase your die-off. Increase your meat stock. <laughs> or increase the amount of probiotic foods you're giving your child. Very good idea. Um, and make sure you're constraining sweets. So it just means you haven't reached a place yet, Elliot, where he's got anything to die off. So keep increasing meat stock. Meat stock. Keep increasing uh, probiotic foods like sauerkraut juice, like beet kvass, like uh, vegetable medley juice. Fabulous. If you want a little bit of die off, that's made with kefir whey. That's its gift, vegetable medley. All right, let's go back here all the way up to the top. When I was saying hello, Vicky, hello, Vicky. All right. Here's a question from Ellie. I can't seem to understand how to make sour cream. Is that using the 24 hour cultured yogurt and adding raw cream or leave and leaving out? Okay, Ellie. So I just want to let you know, everyone, that Dr. Natasha calls sour cream. No, she uses the term sour cream for cultured cream. So that means you take cream and you culture it. You can culture cream whether it's raw or pasteurized, raw always being preferred nutritionally, et cetera. If you can get it, get to realmilk.com, find your, that's, find your uh, raw milk near you. All right, so cultured cream is always cream that you have cultured with something. And so in my book, which you've all seen because it's sitting at the top of the page here, 
I go through, I think, seven different ways to culture cream. Um, so, to make cultured cream, which is sour cream. So, if it's raw cream, you can just add yogurt, that's, that's your starter, or whey, that's your starter, or a starter packet, that's your starter, or a probiotic capsule, you open it up. All of those things are ways, methods, to make cultured cream, to culture cream, which will be gap sour cream, if you will. So that's a very easy way to do it. Um, you can, if you want to, you can heat raw cream to 110 and then culture it. You don't have to. If you don't, you're gonna get a product that's a little bit less stable and probably not firm. I'm just gonna give you that. It's nothing wrong with it. It'll be a little bit runny if you don't heat the cream to 110, if it's raw before culturing. If you like a firmer product, heat it to 110. It's not gonna hurt your raw cream. And then culture it. Another option is to, if you have pasteurized cream, you must, you must, please, you must kill everything that's grown in that sterilized cream. They call it pasteurized. We know it's sterilized. And so you have to kill all of it. 100 up to 180, cool to 110, and then culture. I hope that helps, Ellie. You can send me a thumbs up if you get it. Um, so there's many, many ways to culture cream. Cultured cream is very, very good for people that have that are prone to constipation. We love to, I suggest, we, we suggest that you hang out in cultured cream instead of yogurt if you're prone to constipation because high fat dairy, which is cream, will really help you uh, to move your bowels. And also because if you're prone to constipation, you probably have a congested, you may possible have a congested liver. Um, and so cream will help to get that all moving. Okay, hope that was helpful. Let me know, Ellie, if you have other questions. And yes, it does culture for 20, cultured cream cultures for 24 hours. And yes, it cultures on the counter and you cap it tightly and you keep it out of the sun, etc. So that's how you let it go. All right, hello, Dana. Hello, Monica. I have a question about supporting my daughter's gut better. She is having histamine flare-ups despite me following the book. Cooking with animal fats, using all organic pastured meats, using clean probiotics. Is there something else I can do to help her through this? So Dana, I'd need to know a little bit more about, if you don't mind sharing, what kind, what does her histamine flare-up look like? That would be helpful if you can put it in there in the comment section. Um, just for everyone that's new that, that is watching, we really suggest, Dr. Natasha suggests when she's teaching, that people push through histamine. This may not be you, Dana, because just let me finish and you can hear what I'm trying to make a point here. So that we push through histamine responses and um, as long as they are comfortable, as long as you're comfortable doing that, you know, you can push through and get to the other side. A lot of meat stock, a lot of meat stock, a lot of animal fat. We'd like to see your daughter up to a half a cup of animal fat a day. That's eight tablespoons in addition to what you're cooking with. That's in addition to what you're cooking with, right? We're, oh, this is me putting more animal fat on the food before I serve it, right? I've cooked it with animal fat and now I'm putting more in. So lots of animal fat would be very, very good. Um, also, Dana, is she... Uh, if she's on probiotics, I'm assuming she's not on probiotic foods because of histamine issues. If that's true, let me know and I'll continue from there. Hi, Angela. Hope you're well too. Okay. Okay, so Leonie says, I'm not wanting to eat sweet food at the moment. Excellent. Does that mean I must stay on stage five until I want to introduce it? Or I can move to full gaps and slowly add in stage six foods when I want to eat more sweet foods, fruit, etc. That is a really good question. So always we, GAPS practitioners, I, Dr. Natasha, are going to say, follow your body. 
Last week, I think I talked about the article or the chapter in the blue book. In her blue book, this is the book, folks. If you don't have this, I'm telling you, get it. Because it's 100 more pages, 150 more. Look at all that. Yeah, it's a lot bigger than the yellow book. It has a lot more really great, great specific information in it. I encourage you to get it. So in the blue book, Dr. Natasha has published One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison. We know she means one person's meat is another person's poison. Um, and she really talks about listening to your body. So, Leonie, if you do not want to have sweet right now, don't. Everyone, if you don't want to have sweet right now, don't. Remember that uh, it's really very, very important to listen to your body. And if your body's saying no sweet, perfect. So her question is, so what do I do? So remember that this chart or this idea of stages is really what the chart's based on, obviously, is about how to enter new foods into the diet, into your diet, Dr. Natasha has outlined that in a very specific way for very specific reasons. One, way, one reason is to, in the beginning, we cut out lots of carbohydrates and sugar, fruit, et cetera, because we want to starve off pathogens, right? We want, to bring our, we want to bring our guts back to balance. So that happens. And then as we move through, we're, we, are, we are testing out, we're challenging the digestive system with with cooking techniques that are that are harder on harder on the gut. The foods are harder to digest when you roast them, when you bake them, when you saute them than they are when you cook them in water, which is what meat stock is, right? Which is what, uh, yeah, cooking in water is the easiest way uh, to make a food digestible. So, so when you're talking about stage five and stage six, in stage five, we add cooked peeled apple pureed with good fat right so if you're not up for that leonie no problem don't do it i hope that you're up for adding raw vegetables which is salads in stage five so that's where we add salads you can do a beautiful extra virgin olive oil dressing on those raw vegetables and start with them very slowly because again Raw vegetables are one of the hardest things for your bodies to digest, your body, our bodies to digest. So slowly introduce your raw vegetables. See if they trigger diarrhea. If they do, you're not ready for raw vegetables. What if you start seeing raw vegetable pieces in your stool? If you do, you're not ready for raw vegetables. So I would be looking at more of those things. That's stage five. And then stage six is you're starting to allow um raw fruit into your diet so if you're not up for if you don't feel like this is the word according to monica right now i would suggest if you were working with me i would suggest listen to your body do not eat sweet f foods if you don't want to and you can hang out in stage five for a while until you get a lot of raw vegetables in there and you're feeling good stay there for i don't know I don't know, three, four, five days a week, two weeks. Stage five is a nice place to stay. It's a lot of food in stage five. Then you can move to stage six. And if you feel like having a raw apple, great. And if you don't want to have any raw fruits that are peeled, I would just watch that in terms of digestion and then move on to full gaps. Don't rush to full gaps though, folks, because one more time with feeling, I love to say that, just because a food is on the full gaps diet doesn't mean you're ready for it so for those people who start on full gaps a lot of people start on full gaps because either they don't know how to cook no problem they're learning they don't know how to source yet no problem they're figuring it out um, they don't know how to ferment whatever that's part of cooking um, or they're just too busy they're busy they're traveling whatever it is and so they um they start on full, but just because you're on full and a food is legal on full, doesn't mean you're ready for it. So I would just say, Leonie, if you're ready to jump onto full, you can after maybe another week on stage five. I don't know where you are with vegetables, um, etc. Uh, but it's not really about, 
I mean, it is about introducing sweet foods and making sure you don't have any die off happen, right? That's really what that's about. It's also about introducing sweet foods um, and seeing if you can digest them and whether or not they end up in your stool. So with all of that said, I would just listen to your body and if you wanna skip sweets for a while, no problem. I think it's a very, very good idea. Remember everyone that when you introduce sweet, meaning cooked apple and then cooked pear, that you do it with uh, making sure that you're adding in some good healthy fat. Ghee and cooked apples with ghee and a little bit of cinnamon is like over the top. Throw on some creme fraiche right before you serve it and you are, that is like oh, heaven on earth. So anyway, just remember to add your fat. Your fat could be ghee, your fat could be creme fraiche or cultured cream. Your fat could be coconut, coconut oil, blah, 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 all that good stuff. I hope that was helpful. All right. Okay, hi, Vicky. Here's Vicky's up. Vicky is up. Hi, Monica, hi. Thank you for doing these for us. You are welcome. I'm happy to be here. It's, it's, it's really wonderful for me to be engaging with people live, if you will. Even though I don't see you, I do see your, you know, get to answer your questions, which is wonderful. Is it possible to make beet kvass without dairy? Absolutely. Remember, folks, I love this question. Good question, Vicki. Ready? You never have to use dairy. You never, ever have to use dairy to ferment a food. We remember that fermentation is based on salt. And the reason it's based on salt is because salt, when I, when I used to teach these live, and I'm going to start putting those dates on the calendar again, folks. Um, when I used to teach these live, I would say that Salt creates the conditions to keep the bad guys down. You have to imagine me standing in front of everybody. Keep the bad guys down, which allows the beneficial microbes to grow. That's what salt does. Salt does not preserve the food. Salt creates the conditions. It sets up the conditions for beneficial bacteria to grow. So you never have to use whey to make uh, a ferment, folks, ever. Um, there, are, there are several ways, there are several methods to make, uh, to ferment a food. The first way, the first method is with salt only, right? You make a salt brine, which is salt and water. With cabbage, you just use salt because it has its own water. So there's salt solo, which is, um, just cabbage with its salt. And all of this, I outline se seven ways to, to ferment in here, folks, in the whole chapter on fermentation, the whole section on fermentation. You see what we've got. So salt solo means just salt. And just salt is what you do if you've got a cabbage because cabbage has their own water. Then there's salt brine. I'm looking in here to see if I find it. Oh, there it is. So if people have this book, it's on page 138. It goes through nine methods of lactofermentation. So salt solo, salt brine, which is when you make salt and water together. And then you've got, then you get into with whey, with starter, which is yogurt or kefir starter. You can also use, which is more, um, more dairy that you don't want. But what are your options, Vicki? Salt and water, which is a brine for you, right? So you just add salt into the beet kvass. You could also do, um, beet kvass is a vegetable. You can get a vegetable starter, which will have no dairy. So you do salt and the vegetable starter. Those are two methods for you to make beet kvass without dairy. You never have to add whey into beet kvass to make it. Um, you can use those two other methods. All right. I have kidney stones. Yes, please, please. If anyone has kidney stones or any kind of stone, beet kvass is a fabulous tonic um, that really can help you. So make, throw in some ginger, throw in some garlic and have beet kvass. Start with a little bit and then work up. As always, that's what we do. Okay. Hello, Linda. Woohoo! She just ordered my book. Why, thank you. I hope you just downloaded the chart, too. Okay, great. All right, so Delphine has... Hello, Delphine. I have, if I have die-off diarrhea just after a food like stock, 15 minutes, for example, it means it's too much quantity and that I have to reduce, right? 
Yes. But if I have diarrhea the day after in the morning, it means I eliminate pathogens and it's a good sign. I must continue. You're splitting hairs here, girl, but I don't mind. Um, so I was just saying, is diarrhea always bad? No. Diarrhea is actually preferred to constipation until diarrhea becomes something that's happening for day after day after day and you're getting dehydrated. We don't want that. However, it's much better to be getting things out of the body and toxins out of the body than, than having um, toxins circulate in the body by being constipated. So I hope all of you are doing, who are constipated are doing enemas. Absolutely, that's the number one thing we want you to do. Okay, back to this thing for Delphine Singh. If I have die off diarrhea just after a food like stock, it means, yes, it means it's too much quantity and I have to reduce. That is a good idea, yes, to reduce. Remember that meat stock is a very healing food and can cause die off at least, at least and especially in the beginning. The more, I have, the more you have it day after day after day, the less, they, less die off I believe you'll have from having uh, meat stock. If you have diarrhea the day after in the morning, it means you eliminate. Yes, we love that you're eliminating pathogens in the morning. Just watch it, folks. One more time with feeling. Your body is going to give you signs. It's your job to learn how to read them. Every body is different, and every body is going to have its own ways of responding to um, the introduction of healing foods. And so some people are going to have itchy ears. Some people are going to have runny noses. Some people are going to have runny eyes. Some people are going to congest. Other people may have headaches. Other people may feel like they have the flu. Other people may uh, have joint aches when they're having die off. Other people may have diarrhea. Some people may have rashes. Some people may have um, hot spots around their cheeks around their ears. I mean, all sorts of things can happen. One of the things that um, the GAPS diet and Dr. Natasha, what she's inviting you to do, what this diet is inviting you to do is to really learn, how does my body talk to me? How does my body talk to me? And to know whether it's, you know, uncomfortable or if it's something that, yeah, so right now, I had diarrhea in the morning. I'm eliminating pathogens. Yes. And to celebrate it. So again, everyone's body is going to react a little bit differently. Our challenge is to, and our invitation, we are invited to find out how does my body work? How does it respond when I have a little bit too much kefir? I have diarrhea. My right eye swells. My ears clog up. I feel a little crampy, a little bit. You know, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to listen to your body and to really pay attention to it as it speaks to you. So that's all good, Delphine. I think you've got it absolutely right. And whatever you do, watch. If you're having diarrhea day after day after day after day after day, then we really want to be using things to firm up those stools we want to be using our favorite thing, or Dr. Natasha's favorite thing, whey dripped from your homemade yogurt or made from your separated raw milk, right? Or dripped from your homemade kefir, kefir. Whey, whey, whey will help to firm the stools. Drink it all day long until they get firmed up. Um, you can also have yogurt, which will actually help to firm up the diarrhea too. So don't let it go too long, folks. Having diarrhea go too long can result in depletion of minerals and electrolytes, and that's not good. Dehydration. So make sure you're drinking a lot of whey if that's happening, and you're eating a lot of homemade yogurt. And again, always we're going to prefer raw milk yogurt, raw milk kefir, raw milk whey made from these things. Okay. That was a really good question. All of these are good questions. I love them all. Keep them coming. Here's Terry. Hi, Terry. When I search for a juicer, is there a way to make a gap shake in a blender or food processor? Stage three intro. So, not really. I mean, yes. Okay, let's, let's talk about what a juicer does. So, 
the juicers that the juicer that we want to use is something that is going to be cold extraction, slow masticating. Those are some of the words that come out. Juice extractor. Why? Because we want to preserve the enzymes in those vegetables, vegetables and fruits, whatever we're doing for gaps. So, when you buy a juicer that's cold, uh, cold extracting or slow masticating, they're going to they're going to preserve the enzymes for you, and we really want those enzymes. They're also going to take out all the fiber for you, which is very important on the GAPS diet, especially on intro. All right. So what does a blender or a food processor do? A blender or a food processor, usually not all, are going to be hot. They're not going to preserve the enzymes, but they're also not going to take out the fiber for you. So what you could do if you wanted to, not the best option, but you could blend up your different vegetables and then strain them through uh, a fine cloth, like two or three or five layers of cheesecloth or maybe a muslin bag or a nut milk bag, the, the ones that are made of cloth, but because you need to keep the um, vegetable fiber out. That's, a pro that's something you could do. It wouldn't be the best, but you could do it. I want to encourage all of you, jump on. There's a million bazillion. You're on Facebook now. There's a million Facebook groups where there's trade, swap, giveaway. Find yourself a juicer that's on there. M many people buy juicers at full price, brand new. They never use them, and then they want to get rid of them for 20 or 30 or 50 bucks. So I, just, uh, I, su I suggest you look around there. You can also look at thrift shops. You can look in... You know, this doesn't have to cost a million dollars, folks. Be resourceful. I know you are. And find yourself a cold extracting, cold press, you know, slow masticating. Those are the, um, masticate means chew, right? Um, buzzwords for the juicers that you're looking for. All right. Hope that was helpful. Let's see. All right. Ellie says, I almost got it. All right. She's cracking herself up and me. So when you say adding yogurt, I have some that I bought from the store. I add that specific store yogurt and add the raw cream. That's it. I don't heat it. So that's correct. That is correct. Ellie. So take, I'm going to do it one more time for Ellie and all of you will learn following along. You take your raw cream. You do not have to heat that raw cream unless you want to heat it to 110. So it's a little bit more firm. If you don't heat it, it'll be runny when it's done. Doesn't mean you fail, just means it's runny. If you do heat it to 110, it'll set up a little bit better. Okay, so make that choice. You don't lose either way. Um, and then you're going to add the store-bought yogurt. Make sure that yogurt that you're buying from the store, folks, if you're going to do that, is organic, grass-fed or pastured, whole milk, and has no fillers. Okay? You've got to look for no fillers. Many of what used to be reputable uh, yogurt making companies are now adding pectin, which we do not want. That's not GAPS approved food because it's a starch. Um, they're adding guar gum. Again, forget it, not GAPS approved. It's another starch. They're adding carrageenan. They're adding locust bean, bean gum. They're adding carabine gum. Any of that CRAP is not okay. So. Get yourself a store-bought yogurt that's fine, whole milk, pastured, um, plain, and no fillers, and you can use that as your starter, yes. Make sure you stir it well, get yourself a little whisk, cap it well, let it go. Let us know how it goes, Ellie. You can post it on the page. You can even put pictures up if you would. All right. Joanna, you answered my question. I never tried heating to 110. Yay! Who knew that I was channeling Joanna? Great. Glad. Okay. Dana says, thank you, Monica. She gets very itchy. She flares in the face as soon as she eats something she can't tolerate. She is not on sauerkraut or dairy yet because of her histamine. Also, homeopath advised not to give her dairy. Okay. Very good, Dana. So here's what I would do. I would be watching the amount of the, um, let me start in another place. It's going to be slow, but steady. And you can do this. She will not always have this going on. So, slow and steady, 
Um, it may be that she's having too much of her probiotic right now. Um, the probiotic capsule that you're giving her, maybe you want to back down that a little bit, but what you really want to do is, or what I would suggest, um, is that continue giving her meat stock, give her a lot of really good animal fats. As I said, do not give her any sauerkraut, keep the fermented foods out for now. You can keep them out for the next six months without a problem. Just, just do it. And slowly, just like I've always said, use that stair-step method of increasing. People who have been on here before have seen me do the old stair-step method, which is you increase, you stay at that level for a couple of days, two, three, four, five, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. You increase, you stay at that level for another two, three, four, five, however long, days, weeks, you increase. Right? We always increase in a stair-step method. We never go from zero to 100 right because that's what gives us big die-off reaction that that's what makes us you know throw up and hang out on the floor which is not what we want to do so just slowly dana just go very slowly make sure you have a very good probiotic going um and start increasing her amount uh slowly slowly and she will get better okay all right, let's see. Next question. My son loved juice. This is from Ellie. Hello, Ellie again. My son loved juice and his own and his almost milk before starting gaps. I transitioned him off that by giving him water with a touch of honey, and he loves that. I add a bit of lemon juice. Is there, could that be the reason I see no die off? I don't know. Maybe, but you know, Ellie. Just make sure that you're not giving him a lot of honey. I hope it's raw honey, number one. It needs to be raw honey, folks. It's very, very sacred food, healing, very good for you. The closer you can get it to your own home, the better off for you for so many reasons. Um, I would be, you know, just watch what he's doing. You're doing a great job. You may want to slowly back that down. So you could either increase the amount of water and have less, you know, right? So same amount of honey, more water would dilute the honey, or you can just start giving him less of that. And, um, you know, see if you could start adding things like yogurt for him or start adding things like kefir, kefir for him. Um, it just means that you probably do, in my, in my best kind of deductive reasoning here, he just needs more probiotic foods in his diet so wherever you are if you're on yogurt if you're on kefir if you're on sauerkraut wherever you are increase and then you should see die off happening again you get to regulate modulate toggle that thing so there isn't a lot of die off and he's not uncomfortable hello adriana okay isn't it normal to find some vegetables in the stool no Things like carrots or cabbage that may be harder to digest or should one, one should never find any. You know, Adriana, to my knowledge, we're not supposed to have undigested food in our stool. That's one of the things that we look for. It's a sign that a couple things are going on. One, not enough chewing is happening. Chew, 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 chew. This is not a train, but chew. If your child, uh, if this is a child, you can make it a game. We're going to chew. Watch mommy or watch daddy or watch somebody. Let's all chew together. Chewing, 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 chewing. So we need to chew, number one. It's also the sign that you do not have, your digestion is not strong. So you may not have enough hydrochloric acid in your stomach. How do we fix that? We could have raw cabbage juice bef before a meal. We could have some more sour sauerkraut that's chewed well before a meal to increase hydrochloric acid we could add in um if you are eating raw vegetables that means stage five you could add in a raw cabbage salad before a meal these are all things that dr natasha talks about how do we increase hydrochloric acid in the stomach and so you can do any of those things. Um, you can also think about uh, a hydrochloric acid, betaine, hydrochloric acid, pepsin uh, supplement. 
So once you start thinking of those things, I really suggest you jump into Dr. Natasha's blue book because she's very clear about how to use them with children, how to use them for yourself, etc. And I would really go ahead and get educated about that. Um, yeah, so those are the two things we, uh, we see. Uh, or that's If we see undigested food, vegetables specifically, in the stool, we want to make sure that people are chewing a lot. We also want to make sure that uh, we want to think about whether or not they're ready to have raw vegetables in their diet. They may need to go back to cooked vegetables. And we may need to increase the hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Bitters are another thing that you can use. Bitters are made from plants. You can find organic, beautiful bitters uh, on the web. I love Urban Moonshine myself. You can um, have meat stock before your meal. That's another way to increase hydrochloric acid. So those are things that I would suggest, Adriana and everyone else. Okay, here we go. Leonie goes, uh, I've been on stage five for at least a month or so. Is that too long? No, it's fine. I had a green apple, uh, add a green apple to my juice in the mornings. Good. I also have a spoon or two of cooked apple several times a week with some yogurt and sour cream mixed together. Perfect. No, you can have it with whatever you like. Yep, that's just fine. You could have it with sour cream or yogurt or both. Whatever feels good to you is fabulous. Thanks, Vicki. Okay, I'm glad you love my book. Thank you. I'm glad it's helpful. Okay. Hello, Maria. Haven't seen Maria in a while. Okay. Okay. Good, good, Ellie. Sounds like she did well on her sour cream, her cultured cream. Gap sour cream is cultured cream. When do you refrigerate it? After it's done. So uh, 24 hours at room temperature, room temperature being seven, uh, 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not sure what that is Celsius. I'm embarrassed. I better learn that. Zzzz. I think maybe it's 40 Celsius. I'm not really sure. I'll have to look that up. Um, you refrigerate it after that amount of time. So 24 hours to 27 hours at 68 to 72. If you start seeing a little, it's starting to separate into whey to break out the whey, definitely it's ready to go into the refrigerator. All right. Hello, Alyssa. Nice to have you with us. I just cut open a cabbage to make kraut and it is brown deep on the inside, invisible from the outside, which looked gorgeous and heavy. I know it is the end of the season for cabbage, but it is because it is getting hot. But what is it on the inside that is happening that is making the cabbage brown with no visible damage to the outside? You know, Alyssa, what kind of brown? Is it like, is it like brown and, um, you know what, I think I had one of these cabbages the other day myself, but it was more white with brown stripes, believe it or not, on the inside, which was I thought was very odd. So is it um, that the brown is kind of mushy? Is it rotting from the inside? Do you think it had a parasite? Give me more and we'll look into it. See if she puts it here, la 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 la. Okay, Joanna asks, on some of my ferments, veggies and ginger ale, I've noticed a whitish film. Is this harmful or beneficial? Do I remove or stir in? Remove, throw away, and then carry on. Usually that's going to be, um, depending on what you used. So was it, um, what did you use as a starter is what I need to know. Joanna, throw it into the chat, oh, pardon me, into the comments. Also, would it be okay to rinse fermented veggies just to remove some of the salt if it tastes too salty? Does this affect the nutritional quality of the ferment? So, yes, you can absolutely rinse some of the fermented veg veggies. However, be sure that you're using good water, folks. And I hope you're not using tap water to make your ferments. Anyone, please. You want to use uh, filtered water. Take out all the chlorine. Uh, fluoride, all sorts of other things that they put in our water. You want to make your ferments with spring water or uh, filtered water that has minerals in it, good things like that. So um, what you'd want to do is make sure that you don't use tap water, obviously. Hope that makes sense. Um, but you will lose some of the, you'll definitely lose some of the probiotics. You'll rinse them right off. So think about that. 
If they're too salty for you, use less salt and more starter in general. That's a good thing to do. Um, you could also actually, Joanna, if it's in a specific, like let's just say one of your jars or two of your jars are salty, open them up, add in some good spring water. Again, not tap water that will kill everything, uh, but some good spring water. Um, you could add a little water that would dilute the salt right in the jar once you've already fermented it. That's just an option. Okay. I'm using filtered water and I used whey to ferment. So if you used whey to ferment, it's probably just calm yeast, the K-A-H-M yeast on top. If you have a little whitish film, just go ahead and scrape it off and off you go. No problem. All right, that should answer that. L Linda says, what do you do with the milk after you take off the cream for sour cream? Ah, very good question. You cry. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. Um, so here's the thing. So Linda, I know, is getting raw milk. And so what I suggest to people is that you do not skim off all of the cream. If you, if you leave some of the cream in that beautiful raw milk, then you can make yogurt or kefir with that raw milk because there's still cream in it. There's still fat in it. Um, if you're going to skim off all of the cream to make Gap sour cream, which is cultured cream, then um, you can water your tomato plants with it. That would be skim milk. Skim milk is really not fit for human consumption. Oh, did I say that? I did. Um, skim milk will make you very fat. Interesting. So give it to your dogs or cats, spray it on your tomato plants or your garden. They love that stuff. Um, send it back to the farm and the, or give it to your chickens. That's what you can do with skim milk, folks. I do not suggest that you make skim milk cheese or skim milk yogurt or skim milk kefir because your body cannot absorb the calcium without the fat. Sorry, my puppy dog just walked in. Hello, Mr. Vinny brought me a present. Okay, so that's what you do. Linda, I hope that was clear. Alyssa says it's a flathead cabbage and is just kind of a light brown. Yeah, I don't know. That's okay. You can put it on the page later on and I'll take a look at it, Alyssa, if you want. Happy to do that. Just throw it on the page and we'll take a look later on. Ellie's buying my book now. Go, Ellie! Okay, that would be grand. Yep. Send it to me after the chat. Throw it on the page and we'll all take a look. Okay, so Delphine says, I love butter and honey, so I often eat them after a meal, but I wonder if honey could feed yeast. Do I have to listen to my body as always to see if I have reactions? Yes, you do. So here's the thing. We really, we meaning the GAPS practitioners, specifically myself, Dr. Becky Plotner, have really been... Uh, asking Dr. Natasha to clarify on honey, 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 clarify, clarify, can people have too much honey? Um, and so her response has always been, uh, or has been lately as we've been asking in the last several months, as long as the honey is raw and best local, of course, but as long as the honey is raw, uh, and people are listening to their bodies, it's far better for them to have the honey if they crave it, if they want it, than to not have it. So if you're having butter and honey, which is what we call, I call the blood sugar stabilizer, out there on the web, people are calling them fat bombs, but they are used, butter and honey is used to stabilize blood sugar. If you want to have some after a meal, have it, enjoy it, love it, be congruent with it, be aligned with it, savor it, yeah. And just watch. I think the, the problem can come in personally when I work with clients, etc. I think, I think, this is again Monica saying, that people can get into trouble if they're having honey all the time. Or they ha they're waking up and they're having honey in their tea. And then they're, and then they're having honey, uh, this is after they've stabilized, their blood sugar is stabilized, right? If a child is eating a half a cup of honey a day, it's probably too much. If they're having a tablespoon or two throughout the day or the equivalent, it's probably fine. So again, we're always just watching what's happening when I eat honey. I feel so good when I have honey and butter. Excellent. Do it. I start to feel shaky after I eat my third or fourth tablespoon of honey through the day. Mm, 
probably need to modulate that honey, that sugar impact with fat. So just, yeah, listen to your body, watch the reactions. Can honey feed yeast? Yes. But, and, again, I think it's going to be highly individual. And, um, you know, watch, who's asking for the honey? Who's asking for the honey? Again, in that fabulous, we started with this, and I want to bring it up again, in that fabulous article called One Man's Meat is Another Man's Poison, Dr. Natasha offers four, uh, four things that she, um, she offers a lot, but the four things that I've been concentrating on with my GAPS chat group on Thursdays are the following around food, okay? What do you use? You use smell? Does it smell good? Mmm, it should smell good, like, oh yeah. Does it taste good? Does it taste good to you? If it doesn't taste good to you, it's probably not a good idea to eat it. Does it taste good to you? Right? Are you satisfied after you eat it? Third thing, satisfied? Like when you eat that, you feel like, oh yeah, I'm good. I just ate everything I needed, I'm good. Or you're sitting there going, gosh, I'm really still hungry. Hmm. Yeah? And the last one is desire for food. So. She says that once you really, so you've cleaned up your diet, you've been on intro, la la la, you're not eating any CRAP, otherwise known as processed foods, or GMO foods, or glyphosate foods, you know what I'm saying, folks, and, um, and you have a desire for food, so if you're having a desire for that food, right, and you're like, ah, oh. like if you ask your body, hey body, does butter and honey sound good right now? And you actually start salivating. Boom. Absolutely, it's time for you to have that butter and honey. I hope that helps, folks. You really should check out that chapter. It's a whole chapter. It used to be a seven-page, um, was it a four-page that went to seven or a seven that went to 15? Anyway, she really expanded on the article in the Blue Book. Um, it's fabulous. It talks about how to listen to your body and rhythms and all sorts of things. So... If you love butter and honey, have it after a meal. It's probably just rounding out that meal for you. Remember, the fat is really, really important too. All right, hope that was helpful. Okay, Linda used, it, used filtered tap water for my first ferment. That's fine, filtered tap water is fine. It's not the best, but it's not tap water. Blech. Which we don't ever wanna use for ferment. Why, folks? Because tap water, unless you have it from a well on your property, water that comes out of a tap is municipal water that has been sterilized and there's all sorts of stuff in your water that will really kill off microbes. All microbes, good and bad. All right. It will be okay, Linda. You'll be fine. Okay, let's see. La, 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 la. Okay, Leonie says again, I'm just getting over a cold and I'm left with mainly dry and tickle cough. I would usually have lozenges to soothe my throat. What can I use? Honey is a GAPS legal alternative. That's a wonderful thing. So you can put honey in. So make a nice um, hot water with lemon and honey. Or just do honey. You can do honey and butter and just suck on it. Honey and, and um, coconut oil would probably be better for you in terms of really soothing the throat. Um, so honey and coconut oil, um, honey in uh, hot water with lemon. Yeah, those are all wonderful things. Honey will really help soothe your throat. I'm trying to think of anything else. I think that's probably a good way to go. Okay, so let's see. We've got... Dana. Sorry, Monica. I hope it's okay. Of course it's okay to ask one more question. My little girl loves beef and pork. However, they aren't that great for her. When she's eating them, she tends to flare up. Do you think it's still okay to let her have them? You know what? If she, So again, Dana, if she loves them and she's managing through the flares, it's probably fine. You know? Um, watch her energy. What's her energy like? It's a wonderful way to know what's happening with your child on gaps. Are they happy? Are they energetic? Are they playing? Are they playful? Are they imaginative? What's happening? Or are they listless and, and in their bed and, and just feeling lousy? If they're the former, which is they're happy, they're engaged, they're energetic, they're sleeping well, then let her have it. I would. That's what I would do. 
That's my thing. Um, if she's having a, a big enough response that it's really uncomfortable, then I would say the answer is probably no. Okay, I was wondering about using lard and tallow in her food at the moment. I'm using a lot of duck fat when cooking for her. So here's the thing, Dana, for everyone, what do we do? What do we do when we're not sure? We start with a little bit. We start with a little bit. So start with a little bit for her. See how she does with the lard. See how she does with the tallow. Start with one or the other and work with it for a week or two and see if she's clear when you cook with lard. That's what I would do. And then once she's clear with lard, you can add that into her repertoire. And then next you can try tallow or try one or the other. Just do one at a time so you can track and see how she does with, e with, with each of them, if that makes sense. Okay. Hello, Maria. You're welcome for adding you. Listening in Alaska. Yay. I need to get to Alaska someday. It's supposed to be absolutely stunningly beautiful. Hello, Carol. I live on a farm. We have our own well. Are you saying our water would be okay? Yes. Unless it is goes through some kind of municipal filtering, Carol. If it's just your well water, it should be fine. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. Ellie, do I need to include any vitamin supplements for my three-year-old right now or the meat stock and sauerkraut juice is enough? So remember that um, I would be including the nutrient-dense foods for everyone on the diet, especially on intro. That means liver 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 did i say liver 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 everyone needs liver on intro um i know it's not written it i mean it's not written on, even on this chart but liver is the uh, most nutrient dense food <coughs> pardon me the most nutrient dense food um that you can have uh, resolves a lot of issues in terms of vitamins and supplements. It's very high in vitamin A, the anti-infective vitamin, and vitamin D, and vitamin E, and K, lots of B vitamins, good for heart health. So I would make sure you're getting a lot of beautiful um, uh, liver into your three-year-old. You can do that by grating frozen liver, <clears throat> grass-fed, grass-finished beef liver, or lamb liver. Uh, or bison liver, or any other liver that's been frozen for a minimum of 14 days. And then you can grate it straight into stock, uh, soup, etc. Very easy way to do that. Um, another idea is to make little frozen liver shots. I call them liver shots. They're liver pills. Um, probably a good idea for your three-year-old to just grate it straight in liver every day. Um, the other thing is to make sure, everyone, that you're having um, bone marrow. Again, for, little, for your little three-year-old, I would be doing a lot of that, making sure that they get bone marrow, liver, and that they're outside in the sun for vitamin D. They'll get sauerkraut juice, and sauerkraut is very high in vitamin C. Liver is high in everything I just told you. Bone marrow, absolute, another superfood. Um, I would be doing that for your child. Start there, um, make sure they're getting those things every day or at least several times a week. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead. What about cod liver oil? Yes, Ellie, your three-year-old can have cod liver oil. Thank you for that, absolutely. So there are supplements that, you're, that Dr. Natasha talks about that all Gapsters or the majority of Gapsters, people on the Gaps diet, uh, would benefit from. One is cod liver oil. You can have fermented or not fermented cod liver oil. Always important to take with butter oil or high vitamin butter oil or butter because you need the essential fatty acids to actually use A, D, E, K, etc. Fish oil is another one. It's a great thing you could start with. Um, in addition to cod liver oil, fish oil is about essential fatty acids. Cod liver oil is about these fat-soluble vitamins. And so, um, yeah. So those are some of the things that you can, uh, can absolutely give your three-year-old, your two-year-old. Those are foods, and they're very, very good for brain development and immune, etc. 
If you have questions about what kind to get, etc., I would jump in the blue book or the yellow book. The blue book will have more information. You can check there. Thank you, Ellie, for that little reminder. Okay, so believe it or not, we are on time. We are at time. Ah, uh, okay. How to combat nausea, intro. Uh, I'm just gonna answer this and then I will go ahead to answer the rest of these on the page, folks. So how to combat nausea. Let us remember, hello, Natasha, that nausea is a usually a response to too much fat in the diet and the body is not, not able to process the amount of fat you're bringing in. So what do we do when we have nausea? We back down the amount of fat and then we slowly start increasing it again. That's usually why nausea is a sign that the body can't process the amount of fat that's coming in. So just reduce the amount of fat you're eating for a little while and then slowly start building back up again. The body will usually become uh, used to using, uh, used to having more fat come in. Um, but it takes a while, especially if you've been on a low fat, no fat diet. Okay. Oh, I have no experience in any types of meat since I was vegetarian for so long. All right. Just a quick thing about bone marrow. You can put the bone marrow bone, the marrow bones right in the meat stock take it out after an hour and then just wrap. You can, you can serve the marrow straight or you can put it back into the stock. That's an easy, easy way to do it for bone marrow. And, or you can mix it into his food. Yep, absolutely fine. That's a wonderful thing to do. Maybe I'll talk more about bone marrow next week. Okay, fight or flight. Oh, too much stress. I'm sorry. Okay, let me see. I'm going to answer one more question, which is, are you going to be talking about the foam that comes up out of bones when it makes me stuck? So, folks, no, I'm not. I'm going to go ahead and answer this on the, on the page. I've gone through a lot of this. Uh, all right, all right, Alyssa, here you go. So one more time with feeling, whenever we make meat stock out of meaty bones, which is meat with a joint in it, could be a chicken, a whole chicken, chicken thighs, could be turkey necks, could be necks, backs, wings, could be lamb necks, beef necks, could be short ribs, could be shanks, all those types of bones I have outlined very clearly in my book and Dr. Natasha does also in her book. We always bring, if we're, if we're on the stove, we bring the pot to a boil. We skim the scum off. We put the pot down to a simmer. We make sure it gets to a simmer. We put the lid on. Done. If, in fact, you bring this to a boil and you put it down to a simmer and it keeps foaming, like foam, like dish foam, like you're washing dishes foam, that means your bones have gone off meaning they have spoiled and you probably you don't want to eat that stock okay all right everyone i'm going to go ahead and close now because we've gone over and i have some clients coming up so i want to thank you all for coming and listening thank you for your questions i will get on the uh on this page and answer the ones that i didn't get to and please post your other questions Alyssa, I'll look for your little video or photo or whatever's going on with your cabbage. We'll talk, take a look at that. And I want to wish you all a wonderful week. And uh, please keep the questions coming. And we will see you next week. Be well, everyone. Signing off.